Sideloading is on the way soon for iOS. Also, usernames in Signal also on the way soon. Tutanota has rebranded and is facing some serious accusations and much more. Welcome to Surveillance Report 156, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news from the past two weeks. We missed a week, so we're playing catch up again. And as usual, we took a week off and a lot happened. So I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from Techlore. Our promo segment, as always, this podcast costs money. There's hosting, there's our time, there's editing software, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to keep this podcast free and mostly consistent for most people, then please consider supporting us. We have a Patreon where you can get perks in exchange. For $5 a month, you can ask a question. For $10 a month, you don't have to listen to this promo pitch. If you are not a fan of Patreon for whatever reason, we have LibrePay, and of course, we always have Monero, which is the most private and anonymous option for online payments. And of course, if you cannot afford anything, we totally understand, you know, share the podcast around, like, comment, help the algorithm, all that fun stuff. So thank you guys for your support. All right. Well, we're going to start with iOS 17.2, which is hinting at Apple moving towards letting users sideload apps from outside of the App Store, kind of like how Android allows you to. So this is from the European Union is the DMA antitrust legislation requires the company to allow users to sideload apps outside the App Store to increase competition. 9to5Mac has found evidence in the beta code that the company is indeed moving towards enabling this on iOS devices. They call this managed app distribution. And 9to5Mac seems to think that this API would be related to MDM solutions for installing enterprise apps, which is already possible. But it seems that Apple has been working on something more significant than that because they analyzed it and they learned that it has an extension endpoint declared in a system, which means that other apps can create extensions of this type. And digging further, they found a new unused entitlement that will give third-party apps permission to install other apps. In other words, this would allow developers to create their own app stores, in theory at least. They also found references to a region lock in the API, which suggests that Apple could restrict it to specific countries, which wouldn't make sense for MDM solution, but it does make sense for enabling sideloading in particular countries only when required by authorities such as the EU. And Apple has now published new documentation for this managed app distribution API on its website, confirming that it is primarily intended as an MDM solution. As we suggested in our report, it could still be used for other purposes. And you can read the original article below, quoting 9to5Mac in that note there. In theory, Apple is required to comply with this legislation by March 2024. But at the same time, Apple will also appeal to the EU about including the App Store in the DMA. But ultimately, iOS 17 can and will be ready for site loading in theory, of course. Okay, we have data breaches this week, like every week. And again, we're catching up. So I'm gonna try to, we're both gonna try to go through these as quick as possible. Our first one says online store exposed millions of Chinese citizens IDs. I'm gonna screw this up. The store is called Zefingal, a China-based e-commerce store for importing goods from overseas. The database contained more than 3.3 million orders spanning from 2015 through 2020, but had not been protected with a password. It contained customer shipping addresses and phone numbers, as well as the customer's government issued resident identity card number. Many of the orders also include uploaded copies of the customer's identity card. It is not known how long the database was exposed, but anyone who knew the IP address of the database could access the data using only their web browser and no password. TechCrunch reached out to the owners who took the database down and claimed that the quote unquote vulnerability had been quote unquote addressed. Personal data of over half a million Marina Bay Sands Lifestyle Rewards members was accessed in a data security breach and is compromised names, email addresses, phone numbers, country of residences, as well as membership numbers and tiers. Membership data from MBS's Casino Rewards program is believed to be unaffected. McLaren Healthcare says a data breach impacted 2.2 million people. McLaren is a nonprofit healthcare system with 14 hospitals with a total bed capacity of over 2,600 and is supported by a team of 490 physicians across Michigan. The data includes full names, social security numbers, health insurance information, date of birth, billing or claims information, diagnosis, physician's information, medical record number, Medicare or Medicaid information, prescription or medication information, diagnostic results, and treatment information. They are now offering... You guessed it, 12 months of identity protection services. Well, on that note, Lockbit Ransomware has leaked gigabytes of Boeing data, 43 gigabytes and more. And most of it was actually backups of their systems, but there was uh, some configuration backups for IT management software and logs for monitoring and auditing tools. Backups from Citrix appliances were also listed, which sparked speculation about Lockbit Ransomware using that disclosed Citrix bleed vulnerability for which proof of concept exploit code was published on October 24th. 
which was very close to that October 22nd timestamp of the data that was leaked. Pharmacy provider TruePill data breach hits 2.3 million customers. So TruePill is a B2B focused pharmacy platform that uses APIs for order fulfillment and delivery services for direct to consumer brands, digital health companies, and other healthcare organizations across all 50 states in the US. This includes full name, medication type, demographic information, and name of prescribing physician. Some of the people receiving the data breaches notices were somewhat puzzled, claiming they had never heard of the company and were unsure how their data got to TruePill. Pill. The article is expecting multiple class action lawsuits for things like failing to encrypt sensitive medical data, a delay in notifying affected customers, which may have led to identity theft activity, and the notification being too vague and possibly not disclosing additional leaked data, such as addresses, dates of birth, medical treatment info, diagnosis info, and health insurance info. PG&A says cyber attack exposed data of nearly 9 million patients, and this is a medical transcription service to healthcare organizations in the U.S. It included full names, date of births, medical record numbers, hospital account numbers, admission diagnosis, date and time of service, social security numbers, insurance info, lab test results, and pretty much everything else about you in the hospital. Our favorite company had a new data breach in the UK. It was Samsung for those of you who are new. So this breach lasted over a year from July 2019 to June of 2020. It was the result of a vulnerability exploited in a third party application that was used by the company. It included names, phone numbers, postal and email addresses. And according to the article, this is the third data breach that Samsung has suffered in two years. Toyota has confirmed a breach after Medusa ransomware threatens to leak data. To prove the intrusion, the hackers publish sample data that includes financial documents, spreadsheets, purchase invoices, hashed account passwords, clear text user IDs and passwords, a lot more about the company and their administrative stuff. Most of the documents are in German, indicating that the hackers managed to access systems serving Toyota's operations in Central Europe. All right, these next two stories. The first one says prison phone company leaked 600,000 users' data and didn't notify them, FTC says. So this is a company called Global Tellink. So the FTC actually went after them. The company has agreed to a settlement that requires it to change its security practices and offer free credit monitoring and identity protection to affected users, but the settlement did not include a fine. The data was copied to a test environment built on Amazon Web Services cloud platform. They were testing a new version of a search software product. For about two days, the data was in the test environment and accessible via the internet without password protection or other access controls, according to the FTC. After hearing from a security researcher, Global Telling reconfigured the test environment to cut off public access, but a few weeks later, the firm was notified by an identity monitoring vendor that the data was available on the dark web. Global Telling did not notify any users until May of 2021. Even then, it was only a subset of them, according to the FTC. Uh, according to the FTC, they waited nine months to notify users and only contacted about 45,000 of them, even though the breach may have affected hundreds of thousands of additional customers. The article says that on multiple occasions after the breach, Global Telling denied ever having a security breach in responses to a prison facility's request for proposals. The data included names, addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, and driver's license issue states. Some consumer complaints also indicated that consumers had been alerted to fraudulent transactions on their credit cards following the incident. Online atrocity database exposed thousands of vulnerable people in the Congo. So the Kivu Security Tracker is a data-centric crisis map of atrocities in the Eastern Congo that has been used by policymakers, academics, journalists, and activists to better understand trends, causes of insecurity, and serious violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. But the KST's lax security protocols appear to have accidentally doxed up to 8,000 people, including activists, sexual assault survivors, United Nations staff, Congolese government officials, local journalists, and victims of attacks. Hundreds of documents, including 165 spreadsheets that were on a public server, contain the names, locations, phone numbers, and organizational affiliations of those sources, as well as sensitive information about some 17,000 security incidents, such as mass killings, torture, and attacks on peaceful protesters. The data was available on the KST's main website, and anyone with an internet connection could access it. The information appears to have been publicly available on the internet for more than four years, so a bit more than those two days. And so a lot of damage could have been done there. The spreadsheets, along with the main KST website, were taken offline on October 28th after an investigative journalist discovered the leak and informed Human Rights Watch and New York University Center on International Cooperation. Transform says that ransomware data breach affected 267,000 patients. Transform is a not-for-profit shared service organization founded by five hospitals in Erie St. Clair, Ontario to manage their IT supply chain and accounts payable. The organization confirms that the attackers managed to steal a database containing information on 5.6 million patient visits, but 
that correlates to about 267,000 unique individuals. The shared drive has varying impact on the hospitals as each opted to store different types and amounts of data on it. So they break it down by hospital, but I'm just going to list it all here. And if you want to know per hospital what was stolen, you can go check the article. In total, it included names, addresses, social security numbers, social insurance numbers, gender, marital status, date of birth, pay rate, current and past employees, patients, a brief summary of medical conditions, and more. A really quick one, Toronto Public Library confirms data stolen in ransomware attack. So this affected employees, customers, volunteers, and donors. And the information was stolen from a compromised file server during an October ransomware attack. And the data goes back as far as 1998. The employee info includes names, social insurance numbers, date of births and home addresses, copies of government issued identification documents provided to TPL by staff were also likely taken. And the library has yet to disclose what customer data was stolen and how many customers were affected. And our last data breach comes from Mr. Cooper, who is a mortgage and loan giant with more than 4 million customers. They have confirmed that data was compromised during a recent cyber attack. That's all the information we have at this time. If we hear anything, we'll try to keep you guys updated. And now companies, starting with Apple. This is kind of, you know, on the surface, an exciting one. So Apple is announcing RCS support is coming to iPhone next year. There still will be the green bubbles, but they might be a little bit less depressing because now this feature via a software update later next year will bring a wide range of iMessage style features to messaging between iPhone and Android users. So according to their statement, this will work alongside iMessage, which will continue to be their best and most secure messaging experience for Apple users. And it will not use any proprietary end-to-end -end decryption on top of RCS. So for those who don't know, RCS doesn't have its own built-in end-to-end encryption, but services like Google Messenger, Google has added its own end-to-end -end encryption on top of RCS. Apple has said they're not doing that, but Apple also said that they're going to be improving the standard and making it more secure. So it's unclear what Apple's trying to do in that realm or if we're going to see end-to-end -end encryption with RCS. I wouldn't count on it, but it would be cool to see. And just FYI, SMS and MMS will also continue to be available as a fallback when needed. Our only other company story comes from Facebook, who is ending support for PGP encrypted emails. This will end December 5th, 2023. The blog post who wrote this says the email encryption feature has experienced limited adoption, mainly because most Facebook users do not know how it works or how to activate it which is fair. They also say it has been abused by attackers in the past to prevent users from being able to read account recovery emails in Facebook. Facebook has not provided any official explanations as to why they are retiring the feature. And research. AIs can guess where Reddit users live and how much they earn. So this uses large language models or LLMs like GPT-4, which can identify a person's age, location, gender, and income with up to 85% accuracy simply by analyzing their posts on social media. They randomly selected 1,500 profiles of users who engaged on the platform, then narrowed those down to 520 for which they could confidently identify attributes like a person's place of birth, their income bracket, gender, and location, either in their profiles or posts. Sometimes personal details were explicitly stated, for example, some users post their income in forums about financial advice, but the AIs also picked up on subtler cues, like location-specific slang, and could estimate a salary range from a user's profession and location. Some characteristics were easier for the AIs to discern than others. GPT-4 was 97.8% accurate at guessing gender, but only 62.5% accurate on income. All right, this next one comes from the EFF. It says, low budget should not mean high risk. Kids' tablet came preloaded with sketchyware. <laughs> So they say it's easy to get Android devices from online vendors like Amazon at different price points. Unfortunately, it's also easy to end up with an Android device with malware at these lower budgets. There are several factors that contribute to this. Multiple devices manufactured in the same facility, lack of standards on security when choosing components, and lack of quality assurance and scrutiny by vendors that sell the devices. We investigated a tablet that had potential malware on it bought from the online vendor Amazon, a Dragon Touch Kids Pad Y88X10 which is a kid's tablet. As of this post, the tablet in question is no longer listed on Amazon, although it was available for the majority of this year. It turns out malware was present with an added bonus of pre-installed riskware and a very outdated parental control app. This is a major concern since this is a tablet marketed for kids, and they emphasize that part. Similar to Android TVs we looked into earlier this year, we found the now notorious Koryov, Koryova? malware directories on the Dragon Touch tablet. The tablet also came preloaded with add-ups in the form of firmware over the air update software that came as the application called Wireless Update. So basically it could update itself and add more capabilities and it was disguised as something else. The tablet also came with a very outdated version of the Kiddos app pre-installed, which touts being COPPA certified and turns phone and tablets into kid-friendly devices for playing and learning with the best kids apps, videos, and online content. 
That's according to them. This version of the app still collects and sends data to kiddos.net on usage and physical attributes of the device. This can include information like a device model, brand, country, time zone, screen size, view events, click events, log time of events, and unique kid ID. For example, we found a drawing app, Kid Paint Free, attempting to send exact GPS coordinates to an ad server. This leakage of device-specific information over primarily HTTP web requests, which means it's not encrypted, can be targeted by bad actors who want to siphon information either on device or by obtaining these defunct domains. And now moving into politics. So this is the last chance to fix EIDAs, which is a secret EU law which threatens internet security. So this is for fellow non-Europeans. And frankly, maybe some Europeans don't know this either, but EIDAs is Electronic Identification, Authentication, and Trust Services. It's supposed to act as a sort of certificate of authenticity or assurance that the website or service in question meets certain digital standards that make it safe for important transactions like paying bills, transferring money, and more. However, a new proposal, according to both critics and experts, would basically allow the EU to man in the middle all these same sites and services and severely erode privacy. The article goes into a lot of technical detail, but the TLDR is that over 500 experts, including people like the EFF, Epic, and the Linux Foundation, Mulvad, and Mozilla, have signed open letters or put out statements condemning the changes, and as of the time of recording this, the EU has done virtually no public disclosure or discourse about these changes. It seems like they're trying to pass this in secret, so for anyone in the EU or outside the EU, doesn't matter, definitely try to share this around and shine a light on this because it is a big issue. We don't like to man in the middle, all web traffic and give that kind of control. It's not a good place to be. All right, the next story, the headline says, court rules automakers can record and intercept owner text messages. So a federal judge on Tuesday refused to bring back a class action lawsuit alleging four auto manufacturers had violated Washington state's privacy laws by using vehicles onboard infotainment systems to record and intercept customers private text messages and mobile phone call logs. So basically, if you're in a newer car and you connect the phone to Bluetooth, it always asks you, it asks you for every single device for some reason even things that don't have microphones. It's like, do you want to allow this thing access to your calls? Well, apparently these four automakers, which I don't think I wrote down. One of them is Honda. I have that one written down. Uh, they all were collecting like the text messages and the, the phone call logs that you would get through the infotainment system. And people tried to be like, yo, that's not cool. And this judge disagreed. The Seattle-based appellate judge ruled that the practice does not meet the threshold for an illegal privacy violation under state law. Washington, D.C. gives residents free air tags to help track stolen cars. So they're planning to distribute these to residents in some neighborhoods in the city as a way to make it easier for them to track down stolen vehicles. And you can pick these up by attending one of three scheduled distribution events next week where officers will install the device on the residents' cars and help them set up the tracking tag on their mobile devices. Our last political story is just a real quick interesting one. The New York Attorney General has issued a $450,000 penalty to U.S. radiology after an unpatched bug led to a ransomware attack. So this attack took place in 2021, exposed the sensitive info of nearly 200,000 patients. So basically what happened was a vulnerability was announced by Sonic Wall, who is a security company in January of 2021. It was used in several attacks. US Radiology was unable to install the firmware patch for the zero day because its Sonic Wall hardware was at end of life and was no longer supported. So the company was planning to replace the hardware in July, but the project was delayed, quote, due to competing priorities and resource restraints, unquote. Therefore, the vulnerability went unaddressed and the company was attacked by a ransomware gang on December of 2021. And then for those who care, the data included driver's license numbers, passport numbers, and social security numbers for New Yorkers. All right. And then the open source, FOSS News, signal tests usernames that keep your phone number private. So this is a long expected new feature that's now being tested in a staging environment, which is essentially a parallel universe is how they describe it, where you can communicate with people in that parallel universe where you have usernames. But if you're still among us normal people in the regular universe, you still can't use this yet. You have to install and run that new build and register for a new account with a phone number. You can then disable your phone number discovery and use usernames instead. They don't have any uptime guarantees and it's likely that push notifications won't work at all. And you will still need a phone number for registration. I already said that. So Signal released a high level overview of their current expense situation. There's way too many details to go into here, but I think the, the big number that really kind of got everybody's attention, Signal spends about $50 million a year at this point on 
infrastructure and paying their developers and stuff like that. So if you like Signal, if you get value out of it, please donate. You know, that's $50 million is a lot of money. If you want to see them roll out usernames sometime before sometime before the universe dies of entropy and heat death, donate. If you don't like Signal and you think it's a honeypot or you don't use it, then don't donate. Pretty straightforward. Decentralized communication protocol matrix has shifted to a less permissive AGPL open source license. So the core matrix server Synapse, it's the alternate server implementation, Dendrite and various related server side projects such as the Sident Identity Server are all transitioning from the permissive Apache 2.0 license to the Afero General Public License or AGPL v3 and client side projects developed by Elements will remain unaffected. So Synapse is the most widely used server implementation of Matrix, responsible for handling user accounts, message history, chat rooms, and more. In its current Apache 2.0, developers and companies were free to use Synapse however they wished, including deploying it in entirely proprietary closed source applications. This is why the Apache 2.0 license is an appealing proposition for enterprises and big tech companies, as they more or less have complete freedom. However, this new license, AGPL, is what's known as copyleft, meaning that any derivative project that uses Synapse would need to be released under a similar AGPL license. So while it forces companies to stick to the spirit of open source, it's less appealing for businesses that don't want to make their own software open source. This also raises the question about what now for the Matrix Foundation, which thus far has been tasked with stewarding the Matrix project. In a separate blog post, the Foundation said it will decline to compete with an actively maintained open source project, and while it still isn't sure about its future, it suggested that R&D might be one avenue it could explore. They brought some clarity to the situation, explaining that the Foundation will remain critical as a guardian of the protocol itself, pointing to the fact that there are several hundred additional Matrix pro projects, encryption implementations, client SDKs, bridges, and more that fall under the um, auspices of the Foundation. Plus, Element is still the primary funder of the Matrix Foundation. Okay, so our next two stories are about Tuta Nota, and honestly, the first one is like super, super short, so I'm just gonna go ahead and combine them. And the first one says, Tuta Nota is now Tuta. That's really it. They say they wanted a shorter name that was easier to share around. Tuta Nota has long been kind of confusing for people. So that's really it about that story. But the next story is kind of a bigger deal. It says alleged RCMP leaker says he was tipped off that police targets had moles in law enforcement. We'll explain why this pertains in a second. So Cameron Ortiz is a former RCMP intelligence officer on trial in Ottawa. And for those who don't know, RCMP is like the, uh, the Canadian, it's their federal investigative service. They're kind of like the FBI or, you know, the KGB. He has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against him, including charges under the Security of Information Act for allegedly sharing special operations information, quote unquote, intentionally and without authority. The Crown alleges that Ortiz used his position as the head of a highly secret unit within the RCMP to attempt to sell intelligence gathered by Canada and its Five Eyes allies to individuals linked to the criminal underworld. Don't know anything about any of that, just kind of giving some background. Ortiz told the jury that while he was leading the RCMP's Operational Research, or OR, unit, he was contacted by a counterpart at a foreign agency in 2014. That counterpart, according to Ortiz, briefed him about a quote-unquote storefront, which the rest of us may know as a honeypot. I don't know if they call it something else in Canada, but that was kind of weird. That was being created to attract criminal targets to an online encryption service. The plan, he said, was to have criminals use the storefront, an online end-to-end -end encryption service called Tutanota, to allow authorities to collect intelligence about them. Quoting him, so if targets begin to use that service, the agency that's collecting the information would be able to feed it back to that information into the Five Eyes system and then back to the RCMP. So Tuta is obviously denying this, and this is linked in the show notes. Here's their statement. This weekend, Tuta Nota was called a storefront and a honeypot without any evidence. Tuta Nota, or now Tuta, is the encrypted email provider service with a focus on privacy, open source, and transparency. It is not linked to any secret service, and there is no backdoor included. It is not even necessary to trust our words as our entire client code is published so that anyone can verify there is no backdoor. In another article, more excerpts of the hearing were explained in which it reads like Mr. Ortiz was using Tutanota to compute with the criminal rather than luring him into using it. So basically what they're saying is he was using Tutanota and it's completely unrelated. Like he could have been using Gmail, he could have been using Proton, he could have been using Yahoo if he hates himself, I guess. They say, we are watching this case with great interest and we'll provide updates to all of our users when we have any new information regarding these outright falsehoods as the hearing will continue. We are actively working with our legal team to fight these slanderous claims. The next two stories I'll combine because they're both from Proton. And the first one is they're doing their annual account charity fundraiser. They support 10 charities 
And so uh, this is all nomination based. And so for all of you listening, you can purchase a raffle ticket for $10 and you can, I think, select or nominate whoever you want. And then they're gonna select winners on December 28th. And the last day to do this is December 26th. The first date to buy is December 14th. So mark it on your calendars if you wanna be a part of this. And uh, that's pretty much it. Just to clarify, I think right now they're asking for people to recommend who they should support, and then December 14th, you can buy the tickets. So you'll be able to cast your vote now for who should get money, and then if you like who they pick, you can buy a ticket later. Perfect. Thank you. The next one is blockchain, not crypto. So this is, again, from Proton, and they are getting into blockchain with something called key transparency, which allows users to verify email addresses. And he made it clear that although the new feature uses blockchain, the key technology behind crypto, key transparency isn't some sketchy cryptocurrency linked to an exit scam. ProtonMail uses end-to-end encryption, and the issue, which is what Yen says, is ensuring that the public key actually belongs to the intended recipient. So the feature will be automatic for users of Proton, which will do a search to ensure that the public key matches the intended recipient. If there isn't a match, users will see a warning. Proton rolled out the beta version of key transparency on their own private blockchain, meaning it's not run by a decentralized series of validators, as with Bitcoin or Ethereum. Yen said Proton might move the feature to a public blockchain after the current version serves as a proof of concept. In his interview, he acknowledged that the feature isn't necessarily for everyday people, but for users users with a sophisticated threat model who need to ensure their emails are going to the correct destination, such as world leaders, executives, and activists. Our next story comes from Mulvad. They say they are moving their encrypted DNS servers to run in RAM. So basically, they moved, I think, all of their VPN servers now run only in RAM, and now they're doing the same with their DNS They are configured using the same Linux kernel with the same level of security and privacy as our VPN infrastructure. This is the next step towards running our stateless infrastructure from RAM. And the last open source news comes from Canonical, who's revealed more details about Ubuntu Core Desktop. This is from their conference, and Core Desktop is not the next version of Ubuntu itself. Ordinary desktop and server Ubuntu aren't going anywhere, and the next release, number 24.04, codenamed Noble Numbat, will be default and come with all the usual additions and flavors. Nor is this the whole new product, though. It is a graphical desktop edition of the existing Ubuntu Core distro. Ubuntu Core is Canonical's Internet of Things, IoT distro, intended to be embedded on edge devices, such as digital signs and smart displays. Canonical believes that it has some unique new angles. Core Desktop is constructed as additional layers on top of the existing Ubuntu Core distro, and like Core, it's entirely built with a single packaging system, SNAP. Ubuntu's new TPM chip-backed full-disk encryption system, which appeared in the beta version of 23.10 Minotaur, is also a component, so the system storage can be encrypted without the need to enter a passphrase to start the machine. For the record, there's a lot more details in the article, and they spent like three paragraphs dissecting Snap and everything around that. So yeah, if you all want more info, as usual, it's in the article. All right, and that'll take us to Misfits. We just have a couple for you. The headline says, Data Broker Staggering Sale of Sensitive Info Exposed in Unsealed FTC Filing. So one of the world's largest mobile data brokers, Kochava, has lost its battle to stop the Federal Trade Commission from revealing what they alleged is a disturbing, widespread pattern of unfair use and the sale of sensitive data without consent from hundreds of millions of people. Again, I'm condensing this. There's a lot more in the article. The FTC has accused Kochava of violating the FTC Act by amassing and disclosing, quote, a staggering amount of sensitive and identifying information about consumers, unquote, alleging that Kochava's database includes products seemingly capable of identifying nearly every person in the United States. According to the FTC, Kochava's customers, ostensibly advertisers, can access this data to trace individuals' movements, including to sensitive locations like hospitals, temporary shelters, and places of worship with a promised accuracy within, quote, a few meters over a day, a week, a month, or a year. Kochava's products can provide a 360-degree perspective on individuals, unveiling personally identifying information like their names, home addresses, phone numbers, as well as sensitive information like their race, gender, ethnicity, annual income, political affiliations, or religion. And this is quoting the FTC, Kochava's use and disclosure of this precise geolocation information invades consumers' privacy and cause or are likely to cause consumers substantial injury. In addition, Kochava collects, uses, and discloses enormous amounts of additional private and sensitive information about consumers. Kochava's use and disclosure of this data, whether alone or in conjunction with Kochava's geolocation data, also invade consumers' privacy and cause or are likely to cause consumers substantial injury. 
They say that Kochava could implement safeguards to protect consumer privacy, such as blacklisting sensitive locations from its data feed or removing sensitive characteristics from its data at a reasonable cost and expenditure of resources, but deliberately choose not to. Instead, they are actively promoting their data as a means to evade consumers' privacy choices. Further, the FTC alleges that there are no real ways for consumers to opt out of Kochava's data marketplace because even resetting their mobile advertising IDs won't stop Kochava's customers from using products to determine other points to connect to and securely solve for identity. For these reasons, the FTC is seeking a permanent injunction to stop Kochava from its allegedly unfair use and sale of consumer data. And the judge wrote in an order to unseal the amended complaint that the FTC still has to prove that Kochava has violated the act, but its arguments are sufficient to survive Kochava's motion for sanctions, which the judge also denied. According to the judge, Kochava, quote, has not offered any compelling reason to maintain the amended complaint under seal, unquote. Certainly, the FTC's allegations cast Kochava's services in an unfavorable light, but that is no reason to shield the complaint from public view. Private UK health data donated for medical research shared with insurance companies. So an observer investigation is found that UK Biobank opened up its vast biomedical database to insurance sector firms several times between 2020 and 2023. The data was provided to insurance consultancy and tech firms for projects to create digital tools that help insurers predict a person's risk of getting a chronic disease. The findings have raised concerns among geneticists, data privacy experts, and campaigners over vetting and ethical checks at Biobank. So this was set up in 2006 to help researchers investigating diseases. The database contains millions of blood, saliva, and urine samples collected regularly from about 500,000 adult volunteers, along with medical records, scans, wearable device data, and lifestyle information. Proved researchers around the world can pay between 3,000 to 9,000 pounds to access records ranging from medical history and lifestyle information to entire genome sequencing data. The resulting research has yielded major medical discoveries that led to Biobank being considered a jewel in the crown of British science. Biobank said it strictly guarded access to its data, only allowing access by researchers for health-related projects in the public interest. But evidence gathered by the observer suggests Biobank did not tell participants it would share data with companies, and made several public commitments not to do so. When the project was announced, Biobank promised that data would not be given to insurance companies after concerns were raised that it could be used in a discriminatory way, such as by the exclusion of people with a particular genetic makeup from insurance. The promise was also reiterated in several public statements by backers of the company who said safeguards would be built in to ensure that no insurance company or police force or employer will have access. This weekend, Biobank said the pledge, made repeatedly over four years, no longer applied. It said the commitment has been made before recruitment formally began in 2007, and that when Biobank volunteers enrolled, they were given revised information. As well as insurance sector firms, Biobank data has also been given to other companies that are not directly health-related, including pension funds and investment firms. Project records show. All right, and our last story is, uh, this is a wild one. Ransomware gang files SEC complaint over victims' undisclosed breach. So the Alpha or Black Cat ransomware operation has taken extortion to a new level by filing a U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission complaint against one of their alleged victims for not complying with the four-day rule to disclose a cyber attack. The threat actor listed the software company Meridian Link on their data leak with a threat that they would leak allegedly stolen data unless a ransom was paid in 24 hours. Meridian Link is a publicly traded company that provides digital solutions for financial organizations such as banks, credit unions, and mortgage lenders. The Alpha ransomware gang said that they breached Meridian Link's network on November 7th and stole company data without encrypting systems. The ransomware actor said that, quote, it appears Meridian Link reached out, but we are yet to receive a message on their end to negotiate a payment in exchange for not leaking the supposedly stolen data. The alleged lack of response from the company likely prompted the attackers to exert more pressure by sending a complaint to the SEC about Meridian Link not disclosing a cybersecurity incident that impacted customer data and operational information. Fun fact, that ruling about the four-day disclosure doesn't actually come into effect until December. So they've kind of jumped the gun a little bit. All right, so that's all we got for this week. So side loading is hopefully on the way soon for Apple. You know, we'll see what that looks like. Same thing for usernames and signal. You know, we'll see when that gets here. Maybe someday, hopefully. Tuda has rebranded and has been accused of some things, but at this time, there's no evidence. If any evidence emerges, we will definitely keep you guys updated and a lot more. Like, um, for the record, I have loved ones that use Tuda Nota. So, I mean... You know, if something comes out, I'm not just going to bury my head in the, in the sand. I'm going to be like, yo, you need to jump ship yesterday. But right. And they sponsor us. So I can't have a honeypot sponsor. <laughs> We're going to have to drop yeah, them very real, quickly. Right? <laughs> that, that, that'll that require a whole video. Be like, look, I called it wrong. They turned out to be a honeypot. Yeah, like, that's 
you know, we're, we're not afraid to own up to our mistakes. We talked about that in the last Q&A. And, so and if that's because, up, I mean, not to jump the ship on the freaking promo segment, but that's because we have patrons and that's because we have all these other support methods. Like, at least that's, yeah. I can speak for Techler and I'm sure I can speak for the new oil. Like, we're, we can have that kind of independent voice because we have so many different revenue sources. It's pretty cool. Well, I can be independent because I have a day job. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> if you guys want to like help us stay independent, yeah, we have Patreon, $5 a month. You get to ask a question in the Q&A, which will be coming out later this week. $10 a month, you don't have to listen to the, the promo segment, and you get to hear more of our thoughts and analysis. Libra Pay, if you are not a Patreon fan for whatever reason, but you want something recurring. And of course, Monero, if you don't want any of that and you just want to support us in the most privacy-respecting way possible, we don't see anything about you, but we do see all the contributions and we're very grateful. And of course, like I said, if you cannot afford to give anything right now, trust me, I know our grocery bill is insane right now. Uh, talking about me and my wife, our grocery bill is crazy. I get it, but you know, there's always sharing the podcast around. There's thumbs up, leaving five stars leaving some comments, all that kind of stuff. So, and on that note, that is the final thing we want to ask of you. If you know, if you found anything interesting on this episode today or any stories that are relevant to anybody you know, please be sure to go ahead and share it around, leave a rating, leave a comment. We're trying to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy, and we can't do that without you. So thank you all for listening. And we'll be back hopefully next week and not miss another week and have to do two weeks of catch up again, because that always sucks. So thank you guys, and we'll see you next time.